variety of ways. You can go download this off the net today. Now, here comes the warden. Originally, World of Warcraft didn't have this. They, they added this after they released the game. Um, warden, by the way, isn't, wasn't built originally for World of Warcraft. I believe it was also used in Diablo 2. In fact, if you disassemble the warden, you'll actually see references to D2 client, things like that. So the warden works. It totally blew us out of the water. The problem is we don't actually know what the warden's going to do because it's downloaded off the server on the fly. So you have the sphere of the unknown built into it. And they don't leave it on. They'll turn it on selectively for a weekend, ban 67,000 accounts, and then turn it off and let it go for another couple of weeks and then turn it on again. So you're kind of living in fear all the time of getting your, you know, losing your account. Um, the code can change at any time, and it scans memory and some other things. So I'm going to show you what I, what I learned about it. First of all, it runs from the main thread. This is important. This is the key for my ability to actually get around the ward and being able to detect me. I'm going to, um, I'll show that later in the slides. But at any rate, what it's going to do when, it, when a per certain message comes in is it's going to go up here and find this injected DLL and this detour patch. It can scan memory and easily see that there's an integrity violation on the detour patch, as well as it can uh, get all the DLLs out of memory and see that there's an injected DLL. Furthermore, it doesn't stop there. It scans all of memory inside the process. It grabs all the window text from all the open windows on your system. As well, it also opens up all the other processes and reads their memory. And it scans all that memory looking for botting programs and cheats. So let me show you a quick uh, reverse engineering session that I did. How do you find the warden? How do you capture it? How do you even get to it in the first place? So inside of World of Warcraft, there is a class called Net Client. In the Net Client class, you can get down and find the receive. The receive will process packets, send them out. There's, um, there's a type field in the packet. The type 2E8 is the one for the warden. It shoots off about every, I think, 15 seconds. Now, unfortunately, I had to redact my slides. Um, as you know, Blizzard's rather um, aggressive about suing people. I don't want to be sued, so. I did leave in just enough information, though, so you can see what's going on. Here's the call to receive. OK, so this is where the packet arrives off the network. This isn't very hard to find on your own. <clears throat> Now, just a little ways down, you see we compare for the type, 2E8. That's the uh, warden packet. And then you see the move warden entry down there. And then very shortly, you'll see a call through a pointer. That, that call through the pointer is going into the position independent code that was pulled up into a memory page as it was pulled down from the server. And how do we even know it's called the warden? Because it says so. If you look, you can actually see the full strings uh, the full paths to all the different source code files actually embedded in the, in the exe. So you can see that it's called warden client right there. Now, here's the dead listing for the warden. This, I, again, I redacted this, but I'll leave in enough information <clears throat> so you can see what's going on. Uh, first of all, this slide is just pointing out the warden client looks like regular function code. You can see there we have a push EBP, and then at the bottom we have a regular return. So it's very easy to reverse engineer the warden. It doesn't have anything weird. Here's all the various calls. Here you can see the warden code that goes through local process memory and scans all the local process memory, get current process, virtual query, et cetera. Here's the part of the warden client that reads and compares all the local loaded DLL names looking for uh, bad DLL names, names of DLLs that it knows uh, belong to botting programs. Here it is going through all the external processes and comparing their names to a list of bad stuff. Now, here's a really interesting one. It's actually opening and reading all the memory out of the uh, processes, the other processes on your system. And then finally, and last but not least, here's the loop that goes through and enumerates all your windows and grabs all the window text. All right. So in response to this, um, you can download all the source code for this program off of Rootkit. I just made a little program. It doesn't actually um, make the warden stop working, but it does report all of the activity that it's doing on your system. So the source code for this is kind of interesting. So you should go download that off of rootkit.com. So the question is, is this going to end cheating? Hell no. Um, you can just turn off the warden, maybe. The problem is the server expects a response, so you'll get disconnected. Um, you could probably forge a warden, but I think that's iffy. Um, I didn't try to do it myself. You got, you got to understand, we don't really know what the warden's going to look for because we haven't received it yet. So how are we going to know what to do? How are we going to emulate that? 
Um, if we had captured a known warden, we could probably forge a single warden, but we'd also have to have an additional routine that detects if the warden changes, and then you'll just disconnect if you have a changed warden. And you don't want to be the poor sap who has to keep up with all those new wardens. Okay, now let's talk about some real bots and, and the warden. Uh, there's a really neat bot called Wowsharp. It was started uh, development sometime in, um, I think, May of last year. It lasted probably about six months before it was completely and totally wiped off the map due to the warden. So this is an excellent, this is an excellent example of using anti-malware technology and having it be successful. So there are programs that you can download that theoretically say, we can get around the ward and just run our program, but do you have any idea what it does? No. Do you trust it? Do you trust your character that you've been working on for eight months to this little program? I don't think so. Here's another one, and it's just the bottom. It says, currently RB avoids every check in the warden client, making it undetectable. Whatever. Here's another one. Built-in randomization and completely external thread helps program stay discreet. Okay. This is an interesting program. This is called Wow Sniffer. It's actually just a totally standalone program. So that's another I idea there is that you don't actually have to be in the process. You can just have something that's just watching the network. And that would be interesting, probably. So let me give you a short story. This is what happened to us when we wrote our Wowsharp uh, stuff. Again, let me preface, I didn't actually write Wowsharp. I just worked on some of the evasion parts that were added on top. So Jeremy Coote wrote Wowsharp. It started in um, January 2005 and went live in May. Um, he spent about four months developing it. It was very, very cheap. It's like two bucks a month to use it. Um, and the way it would work is you'd log in and you get your uh, offsets for the various things in the wow.exe client downloaded from his server on the fly. By September, he was dead in the water. And Jeremy did a little calculation and figured for all the work he spent, he probably made about two bucks an hour for the whole, for the whole thing. Um, so he was moonlighting this business. It wasn't his day job. Uh, and the way that his uh, process would work is if a new warden was detected, he would lock out the server so nobody could log in. This was to protect his clients so that he wouldn't get banned. The problem was a really hardcore warden came down that was detecting it, and the reverse engineering time was taking way too long, and all the people who had subscribed were getting antsy, and the pressure just started building and building. So this actually kind of caused, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back kind of caused it to crack. I came into involved in this way too late. I tried really hard to write a rootkit that would get around the warden, um, but the key to the success of this rootkit was memory cloaking. I didn't have memory cloaking working at the time, especially on uh, dual core systems, and this was causing blue screens. Uh, it, I had a version that worked in my system, but Jeremy wouldn't, his couldn't work, and all the other developers got a version to test with that did not include the memory cloaking. We all got banned, boom. And these guys were using their level 60 accounts to test it. I don't even know what they were thinking. So when this happened, we basically threw in the towel. But I, of course, kept working on it, but I just didn't have a lot of time. So what I'm going to present to you at the end of this presentation is really the next level of, of what we started back then. The um, source code to all of this is now available. He just put it all online. So now you can download this and make your own bot if you want. So in the end game, a lot of people did. They downloaded it. They make their own private versions. I understand that many people have undetectable bots today because they recompiled this and made it so that the banning hashes used by the warden can't detect this particular version. But the key is you don't release it. Because if you do, someone at Blizzard is going to find out, and they're going to add that to their banning hashes. What did we learn? Number one, keep your bots private. And number two, the warden works. So. Here's what I began thinking. Well, what if we move the entire bot into ring zero? It sounds extreme, right? But one of the things I thought to myself is, I bet you Blizzard's not willing to go to ring zero with their warden, because it's going to introduce potential instability in the system. They can't make that from a policy decision perspective. So if I do that, I can win, because they're not willing to go there, but I am. Four million, 6.5 million players, I don't think they're going to have a kernel driver. Okay, I'm going to introduce the supervisor. Supervisor is a ring zero program, um, and it has some interesting tricks. It's a full kernel implementation of what we're trying to do with Wowsharp. 
So key features, no process. We don't have a running process on the system that has wild.exe. We don't have any injected DLLs. There are no injected threads. There are no detour patching. There is no debugger. There is no scannable mem memory. All the stuff the warden looks for, we don't have. So the technique I call shadow branching is going to use Ring Zero technology to inject into the target memory a code page. And that code page is going to do all the botting for us. But in addition to that, when we hijack the thread, we're going to combine this code page with a memory cloaking capability that will take it completely out of the user process memory. How many people here know what a page table is? All right, so you're thinking, thinking how I'm going to go down this road, I'm going to modify some page tables. Finally, in memory, uh, in kernel TCP IP stack, it's not using the existing TCP IP stack, but rather it's using uh, hooks into the Indus open blocks so that it's like basically a TCP in the kernel on the side. For those of you who took the advanced rootkit training that Jamie and I gave on Monday and Tuesday, you've been given almost all of this technology. So for those of you who haven't taken the course yet, and if you really want to get your hands on this stuff, we give it all out in our, in our training program. OK, so here's the overall architecture. Uh, we have a botting application which is running on the controlling machine. This botting application is just a standard, regular Win32 app, and it has built into it a scripting language called Lua, L-U-A. This is the actual intelligence of the bot. It structures messages which are passed over the network and the read into the supervisor. The supervisor is running in ring zero on the slave machine. In user mode, wow.exe is running and there's an implant. The implant is being cloaked. That's the part we have to cloak from the warden. The message will go to the implant. The implant will process that message, put the results back into the message. The message will be copied back out in ring zero and sent back to the botting application. So you can see this is kind of, you can see how the message flow will work. It's completely controlled from the botting application. So here's a summary of all the components. We have the body application, which I call antifreeze.exe. This is still in prototype form. At the end of my slide presentation, I am going to show anybody in here who happens to work for Blizzard how to defeat all my stuff. So I figure by the time I get home, it's not going to work anyways. The supervisor.sys rootkit, the message structure itself, and then finally the implant, which is like a tiny little virtual machine kernel with a byte code that it can work with. So imagine it has its own little byte codes that it, that it works with. OK, so shadow branching doesn't use a detour. What we're going to do instead is use a hardware breakpoint. Setting a user mode hardware breakpoint from the kernel is really, really hard. It took me a long time to figure out how to do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to hook the same exact location, render world, but without the detour. Um, and furthermore, if the warden wants to detect if there's a hardware breakpoint, uh, we'll, we might want to hook, I don't do this now, but we might want to hook PSP get context so that we can actually make sure it doesn't actually receive that information. Okay, and then we're going to use memory cloaking to protect the uh, injected page. So here we go. Supervisor, when we hit the location in memory where we've got the breakpoint, supervisor will uncloak, jump to the injected payload. This is in the main thread. The injected payload will process the message, and then when it's done, in a single operation, we'll recloak the memory and hyperspace the thread back to its original location. To do this, we have to use the DR registers. So what we'll use DR0 to set that breakpoint, and DR70 is a flag set. Now, to do this for user mode, you understand, when you're in the kernel mode, you can't just set the DR, because that's a kernel mode context, and it's just going to get cleared. So there is a function call that Microsoft has in there that you're supposed to be able to use to set a thread's context called NT set context thread. The problem is it doesn't work. There's actually an enumerated type, uh, context diva registers, where you're supposed to be able to set these registers. You can set them all you want. They never actually get set.